more. And uh, we're continuing our chapter by chapter, verse by verse study through the book of Proverbs, actually through the entire Old Testament. And the book of Proverbs states its explicit purpose very early in the book. You remember way back to chapter one, several months ago, we read the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Uh, chapter one, verse seven. And, and I bring that up again because last week, chapter 23, verse 19, again, we saw that same thing going on. Hear my son and be wise. And the fear of the Lord here uh, refers specifically to our viewing him with respect that he deserves. It's not being afraid with humble trust. And only then, Proverbs teaches, will we discover knowledge and wisdom. So we're going to continue this. And we're continuing in chapter 24 tonight. The other interesting thing that I find in here that I like so much about this book and why I believe it gets read so often is it's unlike the things that Moses said. Moses went on to say, thus saith the Lord, or God is speaking this to you. Solomon, on the other hand, is a guy that goes, you know what? I tried it out. He was right. Everything he said is right. The, say he said it would, the way he said it would work, he was right. And so I want to keep it that way. And uh, he taught things, uh, Moses taught things as a direct command from God. And uh, Solomon says, experience shows that God is doing those things that are best for us. Amen. So the essence of human wisdom lies in keeping God's commandments. And again, we're in that area where a lot of these are coupled. Actually, chapter 24 is the last chapter that are directly Solomon's Proverbs, because after that, 25, we get Hezekiah's men gathering out Proverbs. So uh, chapter 24, 1 and 2 are coupled together. Basically, it's don't be envious or associate with evil men. So he starts out in verse 1 and he says, Be not envious of evil men, nor desire to be with them. You remember in the last couple of weeks, we've had several do not warnings. Well, this is another do not warning you can add to your list. Uh, uh, in the Hebrew, it's literally men of evil who adopt a career of crime. That's what's being indicated here. You don't want to be envious of these criminals. Sometimes people are. You see that car they're driving? You see the boats they got? You see the airplanes they got? You see the houses they got? That's temporal. It's temporary. They don't get to keep it. They may enjoy it for a short time, but it's going to end. So do not be envious of evil men nor desire to be with them. You don't want to hang out with them. Don't be envious of their wealth, their position, or their possessions gained by lawlessness, gained by denying the law, gained by turning away from law. Don't even consider joining them. And he's saying, don't even hang out with them. Some people will say, well, aren't you supposed to go hang out with sinners? And I think we covered this pretty thoroughly last week. I'm not going to go hang out in bars and places like that, but I am willing to welcome, more than welcome, anybody who wants to come and hear about Jesus. The church is open. We don't kick people out. Oh, you drink, get out of here. Oh, you don't believe in Jesus. You're an atheist, get out of here. No way. We want people to come. We want them to hear the word of God. We want to encourage them in those things. And we welcome anyone who wants to learn about the Lord. What happens oftentimes, and I mentioned this before too, but I'm going to bring it up again because it's another key scripture in my life. We can so easily become jealous of people with possessions or things. And it's like, why do they get the things? They're not good people. I thought when I got saved, I would get all the good things and they would get all the bad things. But it seems like the opposite is happening. They get good stuff and, and I, I seem to get bad stuff. And that was the whole complaint of Psalm 73. He said, I feel like I'm just wasting my time trying to serve God until I went to the sanctuary and I saw their end. And that's what we need to consider. What happens in the end? We win and they lose big time unless they come to know Jesus Christ as a personal Lord and Savior. Now here's why he tells us not to be envious or desire to be with him. Their heart desires or devises violence and their lips talk of troublemaking. In other words, their heart studies destruction. They, they think about, they plan, 
and they actually study ways to deceive people, to hurt people, to trick people, to trap people, to steal from people. Uh, kind of reminds me of a scene from a movie. Have you ever seen the movie where they're all planning the big heist, right? How are we gonna rip off this bank? And it gets exciting. We kind of get into it. Are they gonna be able to pull this off? And, and we start rooting for those criminals, you know? Oh, oh, the cops are coming, man. You better get out of there, you know? And it's like, wait a minute. Something's wrong here. One guy wrote about it this way. He said, a great deal of modern entertainment, whether short story, novel, film, or ballad, is based on the celebration of wickedly unconventional it banks on the fact that we as audience members have a perverse attraction, even affection, for those who act out of the mischief that we only dream of. Is, is that what's going on? Is that my flesh? I, man, I, I, I like the excitement. I like the thrill. I wonder if I can get away with it. Oh, I couldn't plan what they planned. Man, that's ingenious. Oh, my wicked heart. <laughs> King Joram of Judah is one of the many examples of that kind of thing, 2 Chronicles 21. And uh, they, they seemingly easy and, and they get quick money and they gain status through violence and troublemaking. And the Lord is saying right here, that is a temptation. The Lord through Solomon, that is a temptation I want you to avoid. Now again, comparing Moses with Solomon, Moses would say, don't steal. Okay, don't covet. And Solomon goes, okay, I tried it. <laughs> and Moses is right and God is right. These are not things that a wise man or a wise woman should be doing. Verse three and four are connected. This is wisdom in the home. It says through wisdom, a house is built and by understanding it's established. Now. Usually when you read through wisdom, a house is built, we think of, first of all, the physical building of a house. Somebody getting out there with hammer and nails and a set of plans. But that all has to be planned, too. There needs to be wisdom in the proper engineering. There needs to be wisdom uh, in the construction. There needs to be wisdom in the pouring of the concrete. And it takes the same wisdom and greater, actually, to build a house that's moral and has spiritual values. It takes wisdom to build a house, but I think it takes even more wisdom to build a home. It's hard, it's a difficult job. But those moral and spiritual values must be built through wisdom and established through understanding. We all know that the best foundation we could ever have is the rock, Jesus Christ. You remember in the New Testament, he talks very strongly about foundations. We read in Matthew 7 where he says, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine, this is a parable, and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who builds his house on the rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on the house, but it didn't fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house upon the sand, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the wind blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. You know what? There are storms in life. Stuff is going to come along. Stuff is going to beat you up. It happens to every single one of us. There's not a person in this room that could say, honestly, I've never had any diversity in my life. I think the degree of diversity uh, is different oftentimes depending upon the strength that the Lord gives you, what he's teaching you, what he's taking you through, how he's going to use you. But there's going to be storms in life and we've got to stay on the foundation, no matter what comes. And we don't want to do like it said in the first couple of verses, look out the house and say, hey, their house is still standing, but they didn't put up a foundation. You know what, eventually it will fall. It will not stand but that house on the foundation will. In verse four, he says, by knowledge, the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. So the blessing of building a home with God's wisdom, God, God's understanding and God's knowledge, he says, is going to bring pleasant, precious riches. 
And again, from a carnal point of view, we automatically think, am I going to be rich? Am I going to have a big fancy house? Not necessarily, but you may have a peaceful house. And Solomon has already told us, better to have a peaceful house than a brawling house. Better to have uh, vegetables to eat than a stalled ox, uh, a giant barbecue, if there's anguish and argument and everything else going on in the house. We want it built with spiritual riches. And uh, the spiritual house uh, is what we should be building. You can never be poor spiritually as long as you're seeking the Lord. And uh, God's blessing is on the home that seeks and honors his wisdom. Even though sometimes it may not feel like it. Wisdom fills the house with the word of God. Wisdom fills the house with the songs of God. Wisdom fills the house with testimony and it fills the house with pleasant things. Those are pleasant things. If you've lived in a home where the word is never taught, where the worship is never sung, where testimony is never given, where people are argumented and selfish and self-centered, you understand the difference of being able to come home to a safe, secure place and relax in the Lord as opposed to the places that the world go home and try to relax and remain safe. Verses five and six go together. This is the strength of wisdom. I, I think this actually ties together a little bit here. A wise man is strong. Yes, a man of knowledge increases strength. Or in other words, wisdom enables a man to use his full strength potential, his full strength to his advantage. The wise person realizes and I think a lot of us do as we grow in the old, we're not self-sufficient. We need to call on others. Uh, we look at our own imperfection, and we look to others to help us make it through a shortfall. The wisdom is the knowledge of the Lord. It's the strength that is much more than physical can ever exceed or achieve. And a wise man is strong because he fights the right battles. Well, how do I know what battles are the right ones? Well, it's by wise counsel you wage your own war, and in a multitude of counselors there's safety, or success in war, or this can be translated in the Hebrew, a war to your advantage. Isn't that how you want all your wars to be, to your advantage? <laughs> a war to your advantage. Wage war literally means to seek to overcome any obstacle that one may face in their life. I'm, I'm in a war. You're in a war. We're in a daily war. Paul tells us we're in spiritual battle. The strange thing about spiritual battle is the enemy is very clever and you don't always know where the attack is coming from. You may feel safe in certain places, but they're not. Because sometimes that attack comes from inside where you never expected it. And we have to be careful. Wise strategy is more important than mere strength. We know how to fight and when to fight because we surround ourselves with wise counselors. David not only sought the Lord for his direction, but he had guys like Ahithophel and Hushai to be there to give him counsel, to give him wisdom, to give him guidance and direction also uh, besides just seeking the Lord. I mean, just seeking the Lord's enough, but he's given us other people so that we can be a comfort and encourage to each other. As we've seen in past Proverbs, a multitude of counselors is not going from counselor to counselor to counselor until you find somebody who agrees with you or says what you want to hear. I, I see a lot of that in, I'll just say counseling. I won't say just secular counseling. It's biblical counseling too. People will go from church to church to church or pastor to pastor to pastor or a psychologist to psychologist or a uh, marriage family therapist to marriage family therapist because this person is horrible. They're not telling me what I need to hear. They're not telling me what I want to hear. Take it back to the word of God. It's not going from counselor to counselor. It's listening to a multitude of counselors. Several counselors agreeing together. I would like to recommend highly, and I'm sure you would too, 66 counselors that have been given to us that seem to be able to handle every question but we have to be in the book we have to be studying the book we have to keep learning the book and as we go through the word we get to talk to the wonderful counselor that we know about 
and he'll meet with you anytime. I know a lot of counselors are busy, you need an appointment. Some counselors are expensive, but he'll meet with you anytime in any place. Verses seven through nine are um, triplet. It's the sin of foolishness. Verse seven, wisdom is too lofty for a fool. He does not open his mouth in the gate. You remember that the gate in the city was the place of judgment. It was the place where wise men and elders would gather together to discuss matters and uh, decisions that needed to be made. You're not going to find the fool there. He doesn't have anything to say. Uh, if he does say something, it's foolish and everybody will let him know. If I'm filled with God's word, we will always have something to say. We've always got something to share with people. We will speak wise words if we have his words in our hearts and in our mouth. Verse 8, he who plots to do evil will be called a schemer or a mischievous person or an annoying troublemaker. In the Hebrew, this can literally be translated the master of mischief. Sometimes I think that's my grandsons. And how do they know about them? But the master of mischief. And there are those who think about how to accomplish evil things. That's what they do. How can I stir up trouble? How can I make problems for people? Some of you may have had neighbors like that who do those kinds of things, you know? But he who plots to do evil will be a schemer. The devising or thoughts of the foolish is sin. Another possible meaning in the Hebrew is sin is the scheming of folly. If I let my mind wander into foolish areas and to fantasies and unwise, crazy things, there is sin. It'll come up. It'll happen. And uh, as a result of that, I could fall in. It's not a safe place to be. We're told in 2 Corinthians to take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. Once again, because we are at a war on a daily basis, the primary point of, of 2 Corinthians in that section is that, that we are in spiritual warfare. What leads up to the statement that we take every thought captive is in verse 3, Paul says that we walk in the flesh, uh, we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Though we walk in the flesh, we don't war after the flesh. That is, we don't rely on human ingenuity or man-made plans to bring the victory. The flesh is powerless uh, against the wilds of the devil. In verse, Paul, in verse 4, Paul mentions the strongholds or the fortresses that are destroyed by God's power. And what he's saying is there is no other way to destroy them. You can try, you can attack, you can fight back. You need the Lord. These strongholds are the philosophies, the arguments, the proud opinions mentioned in verse 5 of 2 Corinthians. Uh, many human thoughts, I think, that need to be taken captive. Numerous ungodly philosophies that surround us and hold people in bondage. And I think in our day, these systems include the theories of evolution, secular humanism, existentialism, the cults, the occult, false religions. How many people have you met that are held captive by the idea that they're products of a godless universe? Oh, I just came into being. There's no God. I just showed up here out of the primordial ooze, they tell me. How many spiritual prisoners label under the requirements of false religion, waiting for freedom? But somebody needs to tell them the difference. False religion, secular philosophy have created thinking that's imprisoned millions of minds. That's the spiritual battle. Our weapons in the spiritual battle are not carnal, but mighty through God. And we are transformed by the renewing of my mind. I've got to wash it with the word. That's what transforms me. We take every thought captive we pull down the strongholds, and by the grace of God, we set captives free. Thoughts of foolishness is a dangerous thing, because we read a couple of weeks ago, as a man thinks, so he is, or so will he be. 
the, the devising of foolishness is sin, and the scoffer is an abomination to men. He's an abomination because he stirs up strife and he causes problems with the people around him. He encourages and promotes foolish things, and the sin that the world has to offer. I think probably one of the greatest examples of this would be the Pharaoh of Egypt. Who is God that I should let these people go, you know? He's an example of a, a scoffer, an abomination to humanity. All humanity, we don't know who that Pharaoh is specifically, but nobody likes him. We know he was the mean guy that imprisoned everybody. The Septuagint call these scoffers pest, incorrigible, and proud persons. Verse 10 is the measure of strength. If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. And again, the day of adversity comes to everyone. Everyone in here has had a day of adversity. And if you haven't, uh, I guarantee one is coming. Even if you have several in the past, it's going to come. The good and the evil face adversity. They'll experience adversity. And that's a test to see whether or not they will faint. That's what it's about. What the writer is saying here is that many people are strong when everything's going their way. Hey, how you doing? Oh, great. Everything's wonderful. Just got a raise. My car is running good, you know. I had the transmission check. Turned out to be okay. Didn't cost me anything, you know. Lord's blessing me. Then the first trial comes along. How you doing? Everything's gone wrong. I don't know why the Lord let this happen. It basically says, my strength is small. I'm not trusting the Lord. I'm trusting something else. Your trust was in yourself or in your possessions, and trusting self is very small, especially compared to God. The day of adversity did not make your strength small. It revealed your strength to be small. The hour of trial manifests what strength you really have. To faint or become disheartened shows you're not completely counting on or depending upon God for your deliverance. You're trusting your own strength. Trials are not necessarily meant to break you, though they can do that. But God uses it as a form of teaching to let you know what you're really made of. God uses tests to prove us and strengthen us. I have a favorite passage, really caught my attention in Deuteronomy one time. And this is the Lord speaking, and he says to Moses, you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and test you to know what was in your heart and whether you would keep his commandments or not. Wow, a 40-year trial to humble you? Could that happen? Yeah, Jeremiah had a ministry that lasted for 40 years. How many people did it lead to the Lord? Zero. How many people today would look at that ministry and go, what a lousy ministry. It's unfruitful. But he was doing exactly what God had called him to do. So a 40-year trial to test you, and the testing was not so that God would know their heart. God already knew their heart. It was to reveal to them what your heart is. I need to find out what's in me. I need the Lord to do whatever is necessary to show me what the truth is. He was testing their hearts. I, I don't know how I'm going to do or how I'm doing until I have a trial. And that'll reveal to me how I'm doing. So there's a sense in which we should welcome the day of adversity as a revelation of our strength or weakness so that we know if we're depending on the Lord or not. If you feel your strength is small, commit yourself daily to him and meditate on this his grace is sufficient for you so if you faint in the day of adversity your strength is small it just shows me how my strength is verses 11 and 12 are a pair help rescue those on their way to destruction verse 11 deliver those who are drawn toward death and hold back those stumbling to slaughter this uh, is looked at a couple of different ways. It could be literal prisoners who have been presumably wrongfully condemned to die. That happens. 
Alternatively, these are people stumbling toward death because of their moral and spiritual blindness. Uh, I think as Christians, that's more of what we think of when we read something like this. But uh, the story of Esther is a, a wonderful example of someone who was able to deliver her people from death. She could have ignored what her uncle had told her. She could have said, you know, what? that's not my business. I'm in the palace now. I'm okay. But she did what was necessary to redeem her people, those who were born, uh, drawn towards death. She, she didn't ignore her duty, which would have been easy to do. And for us, there's a world around us that's dying. The question is, what do you want to do about it? What are you going to do about it? Verse 12, if you say, surely we did not know this. Does not he who weighs the hearts consider it? He who keeps your soul, does he not know it? And will he not render to each man according to his deeds? That's a couple of weighty scriptures there. Deliver those who are drawn towards death. If somebody's in danger or somebody needs help, I could warn them, I could help them, but if I fail to do so, if you, you fail to help when you can help, the Lord is going to hold me responsible and accountable. Most of us are ready to help people in danger. We see uh, there's a national disaster. We get a hurricane, we get an earthquake. Man, we're all ready to chip in a few bucks and send off some clothes and some food and, and we wanna help out. We wanna be a part. We wanna help these people. And yet we live in a world of people facing spiritual death. People who don't know about Christ. And are we anxious to tell them too? And help them too? The Lord may, may speak to your heart. Go witness to that person. And I may think, mm, I'm kind of busy right now, Lord. I, I can rationalize a lot of things, you know. I've got my busy work to take care of. And what he's saying here is God knows your heart. Verse 12 again. If you say, surely we did not know this. The scripture is saying we shouldn't be indifferent toward those who are headed to death. You know, sometimes they often reject Christ. They reject God's wisdom. They're hostile. And honestly, it's real easy for me to ignore them. You don't want to hear? Fine. Take off. <laughs> Yet God who weighs the hearts knows. Can you imagine coming before the throne of God? And uh, who knows our soul? And trying to justify yourself before him, I ask you to witness to this person. You did? I didn't know. You think you can pull that off, that bluff with God? Really, Lord? Feel the spirit convicting of sin. He ponders your heart. He knows. You can rationalize. You can justify. Or you can ask forgiveness. Turn around and do what you're supposed to do. He knows what's in your heart. And it says he's going to render according to every man his works. Ezekiel was told in chapter 3 and chapter 33, if you tell people, your countrymen, that they're in danger, that they need to turn to the Lord and turn away from sin, and they don't listen to you, then you're free from being responsible for their decision. But if you don't tell them, their blood is going to be on your hands. That's strong. Some people will even say, well, that's Old Testament. Aren't we glad we're free from that? But the Apostle Paul picks up on this same verse in Acts chapter 20. And he says, I have not failed to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore, I testify to you this day, I am innocent of the blood of all men. So Paul is literally using the Ezekiel passage to say this applies to us too. We need to tell people the truth. And as the Lord opens doors and opportunities come our way, we need to step up and take those opportunities to tell people, you must be born again. You need Christ. He loves you. He rose again. He's coming back for you. Prepare to meet him. Verses 11 and 12. If, if I don't do what I should do, then the Lord will see and hold me responsible. 13 and 14 are my favorite passages in this uh, particular chapter tonight. It's the sweetness of wisdom. And he says, my son, eat honey because it's good. 
and the honeycomb, which is sweet to your taste. And I say, amen, I like honey. I think I've told you I use it to bribe my children to memorize scripture. If they can memorize the scripture, I'll put a drop of honey on their finger. When they see the honey jar, it's like, oh, oh, I said, oh, what? Oh, uh, uh, take, uh, don't take the name of the Lord in vain. <laughs> you know? Have no other gods before me. You know, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Honor your father and mother. Okay, you get five drops of honey there. Seems to work pretty well. Did you know, and I'm going to take a little rabbit trail here because I like honey. Did you know that honey is the only food that never rots? Some foods last longer than the others, but honey lasts forever. Uh, tombs in Egypt that have been sealed up for thousands of years were found to have jars of honey in them. And guess what? They were edible. Buried with uh, the long departed pharaohs. And I think the uh, Egyptians did this because... Uh, they knew that honey didn't spoil, and they buried it with the pharaohs because, after all, pharaoh's going to need something to eat in the afterlife, right? We don't know how long that takes, but we're providing lunch. The oldest honey ever found was in uh, Georgia. 5,500-year-old uh, was unearthed from the grave of a noble woman during an archaeological excavation in 2003 near the Georgian capital of Tbilisi. The ceramic jars contain several types of honey. So the Georgian honey is 2,000 years older than the Egyptian honey that was discovered by Howard Carter during the excavation of King Tutankhamun's tomb, 1922. So 14, so shall the knowledge of wisdom be to your soul. If you've found it, there's a prospect or a future, a reward, and your hope will not be cut off. Wisdom like honey will never go bad. Never get stale. There's no expiration date. I like that. The discovery of wisdom gives man a confident outlook on life. As honey is to the palate, so is wisdom to the soul. A sweet experience that will last forever <laughs> learning from the word of god how sweet it is when we learn from the lord taking in wisdom is not going to disappoint you cornelius sent for peter because he had a desire to taste of the wisdom that peter knew uh, that he knew peter could impart acts 10 and and through peter's preaching he found a future and a hope there's one in whom all the treasures of knowledge and wisdom are hidden that's Jesus. My recommendation, spend some time with him and see how sweet he is. Oh, taste and see, the Lord is good. We've read before. Verses 15 and 16 are joined. And this is about the resilience of the righteous. Do not lie in wait, a wicked man, against the dwelling of the righteous. Do not plunder his resting place. This Proverb is another do not command, but this do not is for the wicked man. And he's telling him, don't rob or plunder the home of a righteous man. Those that are right with God. Don't set an ambush to trap this person. Why? Because the righteous person may fall seven times and rise again. Now, there's a couple of reasons that this righteous person might fall. Some, some commentators will actually insist that the fall of a righteous man is... Uh, trouble not sin there's no reason why it couldn't be both I fall because I'm attacked I fall from the trouble I'm facing I fall from situations I'm in I'm attacked I can also fall from sin I give in to a temptation I stumble I fall that happens uh, and again there's no great evil in falling it's when you lie there when you don't get up when you don't stand up the issue is not that I fell. The issue is, did I get back up? And no one is perfect, and God knows this. Scripture says he knows our frame. It's but dust. And we usually expect more out of ourselves than God does. We're usually harder on ourselves than God is. And we're disappointed when we fall. But the Scripture reminds us where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. When you fall, God's not surprised either falling from sin or falling from an attack. He knew it was going to happen. He doesn't condemn you. He 
if you stumble, only when you lie there, like a parent teaching a child to walk. When you have a baby, it's gonna start crawling and it may scrape its nose on the carpet on occasion, but it's gonna to try to get up and walk and you know it's gonna fall down. And what do you do? You say, no, that's it, lay there. I, I tried. <laughs> you encourage it, don't you? Come on, get up, let's try again. That was good. You got two steps in that time. And then, then they get a little older, like my grandson, and he goes racing across the floor and trips him. The biggest trial there is me not going, oh, it's going, hey, get up. <laughs> and he does. And he keeps on running. That's what the Lord wants us to do. Get up. Get up. Keep on running. We will rise again. Father said, eh, good try. I, I see Jesus on the boat. Peter, good try. You, you stopped looking at me. You started looking at the waves. Come on. I'll put you in the boat. We'll do fine. This gives a warning to the wicked, but also assurance to the righteous. The righteous can be confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Wicked people and the enemy will trip us and trap us. Those who have been justified or made righteous by Jesus Christ. We are declared righteous because of what he did on Calvary. And we might fall seven times. And we might fall 70 times seven. But we will rise again. Contrast, verse 16. The wicked shall fall by calamity. The wicked have a different destiny than the righteous. The wicked man, the enemy, stumbles under adversity without rising again. One blow can crush him. A just man falls but keeps coming up. We see the difference in the lives of Peter and Judas. Both of them stumbled. Both of them fell. Both of them betrayed the Lord. But one received forgiveness and got up. The other one didn't and never came up. Remember Peter asking, how often should I forgive my brother? Seven times? Jesus says, 70 times seven. You mean until I lose track? Mm -hmm. I'm sure that his forgiveness for me is in the thousands. Verse 17 is, is a hard one. 17 and 18 are joined together. Don't rejoice in the tragic destiny of the wicked. I think this goes along with the last one. They're going to fall. I will get back up. They will fall. But I'm not supposed to get excited about it. Man, they were my enemy. They're down. No. 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 17. Do not rejoice when your enemy falls. Do not let your heart be glad when he stumbles. If your enemy falls, don't laugh. David did not rejoice when Saul died in battle. David, you remember, even though Absalom, his son, wanted to put him to death, he said, don't harm the, the boy. When, when Absalom was killed, David was still. I, I know he was my enemy. I know he wanted to kill me. But I still feel bad for him. Do not rejoice when your enemy stumbles. Do not let your heart be glad. Lest the Lord see it and it displease him. And he turns away his wrath from him, from him. From him being that one who stumbled, that one who fell. The Lord will see it, and it may go easy on your enemy. Remember in 2 Samuel 16, David was fleeing from Jerusalem at the time of Absalom. And uh, there was a guy from the house of Saul, a guy named Shammai. And he came out there, and he's cursing David. And he's throwing rocks at David and his whole party. And, and one of David's young men says, why should this dead dog curse the king? Let me go take off his head. And David said, no. Why? Uh, it may be that the Lord will look on my affliction and that the Lord will repay me with good for his cursing this day. He's cursing me. Maybe God will give me good back for it. David knew the principle that was written about. We know where Solomon got the idea. Uh -huh. God announced judgments on the Edomites because they rejoiced when the Israelites suffered. Um, Obadiah 12 and through 16. 
this is hard on our flesh. Hard on my flesh, anyway. We want vindication. We long for justice. But we need to go before the Lord and learn his love. Hebrew indicates that the wrath may turn upon you or reestablish your enemy. Uh, ancient Hebrew sage once said, you become the greater sinner and God is more concerned about punishing you than him. Love doesn't gloat over the sorrows of others or when retribution takes place to one who has wronged you. Remember, you're a subject of grace. And he asks, asks us to act in grace because he was gracious to you. You're a part of him. Matthew tells us, forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And again, it's natural to feel bitter or develop a grudge when you're hurt by somebody. It's not fun. And as the bitterness builds inside of you, it's usually followed by a multitude of emotions, feelings of anger and resentment and rejection. And again, a desire for revenge. It becomes a poison, starts eating at you. I, I can't tell you how many people I've seen are just eaten up because somebody did something. And I try to warn them, and I, I warn myself, forget it, look at the Lord. They don't care, they're fine. It's not hurting them. Yeah, they, they're a gossip, they're a backbiter, they've done horrible things, they made promises they didn't keep, but they're happy to go on their way. Put him in the hands of God. You being concerned, you being worried, you being upset, you being angry is hurting you, not them. Let it go. Let it go. Toxic emotions don't change your situation of the person that hurt you. As you let those emotions take over, they change you, hurting you far more than the other person. So take it to the Lord. Remember, it's Colossians chapter 3. The Lord forgave you, so we are commanded to forgive others. This is where we're going to stop this evening. We're out of time, but would you stand with me and let's close with a word of prayer.